Welcome to MLab 1101, Introduction to Clinical Laboratory Science. My name is Dustin Scott Brewster, and this is going to be the first of a three-part presentation for the first unit of this course, the Introduction to Clinical Laboratory Science. For the objectives for this course, you can find them by going to Blackboard, clicking on the Schedule tab, scrolling down to Unit Number 1, and you'll find the objectives. So for the first presentation for Introduction to Clinical Laboratory Science, let's first discuss a brief history of how clinical laboratory science got started. Dating back to around 2500 BC, one of the earliest recorded lab tests was from ancient Egyptians pouring a patient's urine on the ground and noting how attracted ants were to the urine. Although it was unknown at the time, the ants' attraction to the urine was most likely due to the presence of glucose which helped diagnose the disease we now know today as diabetes. Moving forward to, 16, to the 1660s, Anton van Leeuwenhoek invented the first compound microscope, which would go on to be one of the fundamental instruments in the modern clinical laboratory. Leeuwenhoek himself would use the microscope on very, various items, including scrapings from his mouth and teeth, and observe the presence of tiny organisms which didn't yet have a name, but he called them animacules. These animacules were later given a more formal name, moving forward when in 1665, a scientist by the name of Robert Hooke, using a variation of Leeuwen Hooke's microscope, observed tiny chambers in a piece of cork that reminded him of cells in a monastery. Those cells were what... Leeuwenhoek was describing as animacules, which were tiny bacteria that he found on the surface of his mouth. So, jumping forward a few hundred years to 1839, two scientists by the name of Theodore Schwann and Mathis Jakob Schleiden proposed three rules of cell theory. First was that all organisms are composed of one or more cells. Two, is that the cell is the basic structure and organization of an organism, and three is that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Around the same time cell, cell theory was starting to take root, an older yet not widely practiced theory, germ theory, was starting to gain traction. Then, in the summer of 1854, a cholera outbreak occurred in the Soho district of London that sparked the interest of Dr. John Snow. He observed that the victims of the outbreak all lived very close and got their water from the Broad Street well. He believed the outbreak was a result of germs coming from the well and suggested the removal of the water pump. Then, shortly after, the epidemic stopped. <clears throat> John Snow's belief that the germs were the cause of the disease, not miasma, which was commonly believed at the time, was largely disputed until 1884 when German physician and microbiologist Robert Koch was the first to isolate several bacteria, including the cause of the outbreak in Soho, London, Vibrio cholera. <clears throat> he is now credited as, as being the founder of modern bacteriology. This discovery that disease was spread by bacteria led to many changes in modern healthcare. One such change was that the health screening for people at high risk for contracting a bacterial infection. It was determined that due to the close living quarters and lack of sanitation from long sea voyages, immigrants and sailors carried an increased risk of contracting an infectious disease. To prevent the potential a potential epidemic on U.S. soil, health screens were set up on Ellis Island and other ports of entry. Performing these health screens helped identify the need for a systematic procedure and qualified testing personnel. This need helped spur the emergence of institutions and regulations that would grow on to shape the modern clinical laboratory today. In, 18, in the 1890s, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1896, uh, the first clinical lab opened at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Then in 1922, the American Society for Clinical Pathology, or ASCP, was formed. In, AS, in 1928, the ASCP Board of Registry was formed to certify clinical laboratory professionals. In 
Then in 1933, the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science was formed. Using some industrial technology for counting particles was repurposed in the clinical lab to count cells. This is known as bioelectrical impedance, and that technology was what was used for one of the first auto analyzers in the clinical lab in 1957. In the 1960s, Medicare and Medicaid were established. And then in 1976, the National Credentialing Agency for Laboratory Personnel, or the NCA, was formed by the ASCLS. In 1988, a huge milestone in the clinical laboratory world was when the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act was passed, and this is known as CLIA 88, and which we'll discuss that in more detail later on in this presentation. In 2009, the NCA was assumed by the ASCP, and the ASCP remains the gold standard for credentialing laboratory professionals today. Now let's go over some definitions. So before we jump into an overview of a clinical laboratory, let's first discuss some definitions relevant to the medical field. A clinical laboratory and its personnel are highly regulated for the safety of the patients they serve. To understand this regulatory process, which we'll discuss throughout this presentation and the remainder of the course, these definitions will help serve us better understand how the regulatory process works. So first off, clinical laboratory science. That is a profession concerned with providing information based on the performance of analytical tests on human body substances to detect evidence of or prevent disease or impairment and to promote and monitor good health. The scope of practice for clinical laboratory science is defined by the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science, or ASCLS. They're responsible for assuring reliable test results which contribute to the prevention, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of physiological and pathological conditions. Accreditation is a voluntary process in which a non-governmental agency grants recognition to institutions or programs that meet or exceed established standards of quality. Registration is a general term referring to the voluntary process that all persons who engage in a given occupation register with the designated government agency. Certification is a process by which an individual or institution is evaluated and recognized as meeting certain predetermined standards. This is usually a non-government agency and is a voluntary process. Examples of certification include the ASCP exam for medical technology. Licensure is the granting of permission by an authority, which is usually a state, to an individual or organization in some practice or activity. Examples of licensure include state licensure for physicians and nurses. It should be noted that Texas does not require licensure for clinical laboratory professionals. Continuing education is a type of professionalism that includes continuing your education after graduation or receiving certification. The ASCP requires continuing education in order to maintain certification. So now let's talk about an overview of the personnel operating a clinical laboratory. Inside a clinical laboratory, you'll usually find three types of operators. These include phlebotomists, which are often found in specimen processing, the receiving area, and are responsible for specimen collection. Working the clinical lab and running the tests are medical laboratory technicians, and medical laboratory scientists. Medical laboratory scientists are often called clinical laboratory scientists or medical technologists, although medical laboratory scientists is the preferred title. So to review more about the job responsibilities of these three operators, you can read further at the uh, following two websites, which you'll also need to complete the unit one assignment. Now let's talk about professionalism. This is an incredibly important topic, and regardless of where you work in the clinical lab or anywhere in healthcare, it's always important to work and operate with a high degree of professionalism. What does it mean to be a professional? 
It means to be courteous, not only to your coworkers, but the patients you serve. Be conscientious of your job duties and responsibilities and maintaining a high degree of integrity with everything that you do. Of course, being businesslike in appearance and behavior, that means coming to work well-groomed, well-dressed, neatly put together, and maintaining a positive, good attitude. Why is professionalism important, particularly in healthcare? Well, it promotes confidence, again, not just amongst your coworkers, but the patients you serve. It encourages a positive and uplifting environment, and it also creates safety amongst patients and coworkers. And this is certainly important, especially in healthcare. It is absolutely vital that we maintain a safe and healthy working environment for the patients we serve, uh, but also the coworkers that we work with. That's going to conclude the first of our three-part presentation. We'll pick it up with part two.